Hello, uh, this will be a video uh, explaining how to use cluster chunks to improve falling block swap chances. Um, and I will assume that you roughly know what uh, falling block swap chances are. But um, I'm currently working on a video for the generic method for falling block swaps. And this video right here was initially part of that video, but I've decided to split it off because it was so independent from everything else that this is now its own technical thing. So it's just a small technical video explaining a specific technique to improve chance for falling block swaps. So, um, to um, just recall what falling block swaps are. Uh, a falling block swap is when you have an asynchronous observer line, so an observer line running on a different thread that constantly updates a sand block, and you then replace the sand block by a, a different block. And you have a chance of getting a falling block swap to occur where the um, different block falls down. So if you have two threads, one of them sets the sand to a different block, and the other thread repeatedly the updates the sand using a very quick observer line. Um, then it can happen that the set block happens precisely in a very specific part of a falling block code during which a falling block swap can occur and then we get a falling block. And uh, one problem with this method is that it has uh, not a very high chance of occurring to uh, roughly 1 in 10. And most of the time when you do it, the set block um, doesn't coincidentally happen in precisely the part of the falling block code during which falling block swaps can occur. It happens slightly off and then um, the block doesn't fall down. So let's start off by measuring the normal falling block swap chances. Uh, so I will just be using carpet commands to get myself an async observer line. And I will be using uh, command blocks to set um, the block here to send and then back to end portal frames. And we will uh, do, um, let's do 256 attempts. Um, so now we are doing uh, automatic attempts here. Um, we have the uh, async line blinking over here. And after every attempt, we will put one send block into this chest. And uh, down here in the hopper, we will collect all the, the end portal frames. And, um, after we've done all the 256 attempts, we will see how many end portal frames we've got. So the test is about to finish soon. Uh, we have five more attempts. And then we will see how many end portal frames we got. And now let's see how many uh, items we got. We got uh, 15 items for 250 attempts. Uh, 256 attempts. Okay. So these are uh, the normal falling block swap chances on my computer. Now let's find out what cluster chances are and how we can improve these chances. And in this video, I would just want to quickly explain how you can improve the chances for this happening. And for that, we will be using something called cluster chunks. And in this video, I will also give a quick explanation of what cluster chunks are. But cluster chunks allow us to slow down the, the thread in the observer line while it's in the middle of the same code. And then we can um, make the window in which the following blocks of can occur much larger. And then we have a much better chance of coincidentally um, hitting that window. And then we have a much better uh, chances at uh, following blocks of. So um, this is um, what this video will be about. This video will explain uh, what cluster chunks are. And then it will explain how you can use cluster chunks to improve falling blocks of chances. So um, cluster chunks are. Um, First of all, uh, they are kind of a technique with which you can manipulate grace conditions and you can use them to improve the chance of chunk swaps, falling block swaps, and also getting player heads, which will be covered in a separate video. Um, and in this video, we will mostly focus on how to improve uh, falling block swaps with them. And uh, basically, they are a set of chunks that we load in the game in order to slow down everything that happens in, in a specific chunk. Uh, we will see that soon. I should also mention that Punch 2 is also working on a video on, about the chunk hash map, and uh, that will be give a much more in-depth explanation than I will give of a chunk hash map here. So to understand uh, cluster chunks, we need to understand the chunk hash map. So chunks get stored in something called a hash map, and you can look at the chunk hash map by using the carpet command load chunks dump. And if you do this, then uh, the, uh, then there will be uh, like an Excel file written into like your your server folder, and then you can open the Excel file and look at the chunk hash map. So here's like um, a partial screenshot of part of, of a chunk hash map. So we see right here there's like an index, a key, a x, and a z, and a hash, like the x and z stand for the x and z coordinates. So right here there's, for example, a um, chunk with x coordinate 152 and z coordinate minus 15 um, at index 4 of the chunk hash map. Um, and when you load a new chunk, um, in the game, it, what it will do, it will calculate a, a hash value based on its position, and it will then try to go to the index um, of that hash value and try to um, take up the, uh, and will write itself into that index in, in the chunk hash map, provided it's not already occupied. But if it's already occupied, then it uh, can't take that spot, and then it will just go to the next spot. So, for example, if we have a hash map right here where we have in, uh, the index 5 is occupied by a chunk, 
and we want to load another chunk which had hash 5, so, so this would be another chunk that would have hash value 5, then what it would do, uh, it would first try to get into the spot of index 5, but the problem is that this spot is now already occupied, so what it will instead do is it will go down by one uh, index and, and take the next index. Okay, so this, this is how loading works, and if the next spot was also occupied, then it would have needed to go down one further one, and if, like the next 1,000 spots were occupied, then it would need to go down 1,000 spots until it finds a, a free spot. And um, now uh, the next thing is whenever the game tries to find the chunk, so if, for example, if the game wants to set a block in the chunk, then the game will first um, need to get the chunk from the chunk hash map, um, so it like um, needs to retrieve the chunk from the hash map. And what it, uh, the game does when it tries to get the chunk is it first um, calculates the hash of the chunk, depending on, uh, based on the position of the chunk, because like it knows where the chunk is, which it wants to retrieve. Um, like it knows the x and z position, and it wants to get it from the hash map. And after it has calculated the hash, it will um, start looking for the chunk in the hash map, and it will start at the index corresponding to the hash. So um, the, the game will now look, for example, for the chunk with chunk on that's minus 145 and minus 8, and it's currently at index 6. But since the hash of the chunk is 5, the game will first look at the chunk at, uh, at index 5, and will look whether this is the correct chunk. And what it will find is, in this example, it will find that this is not the correct chunk. So what it next does, it goes down by one spot, and then it checks this chunk. And in this example, this would be the correct chunk. Um, but if the chunk was further down in the chunk hash map, then it would need to first iterate through, through other chunk before it would find it. So um, if you have many chunks in the chunk hash map right after each other, and you um, and you then load a new chunk in the chunk hash map, then it might get placed down way further than its hash is. And if then the game tries to find the chunk, then this could take a very long time because it has to first check all the other chunks which come before it in, in the hash map. And then this search can become quite slow. Um, and now, uh, this is basically what cluster chunks are. So cluster chunks are chunks that we load solely to make it uh, take longer for the game to find a particular chunk, so we slow down the chunk accesses. And uh, cluster chunks are just basically any um, any group of chunks which um, forms like this long stretch of consecutive indices without any gaps. So like if you have these chunks loaded, where there's not a single gap there. Uh, so if you load a new chunk which has like an index of, of uh, one of the first chunks, then the chunk really has to go down all the way. And whenever the game wants to uh, find the chunk, then it has to iterate for all the chunks. And uh, we would say that a chunk is clustered if it's looked up is slowed down by cluster chunks. Um, that makes, or uh, like if the hash is far away from the index. So like if a index of a chunk is far away from its hash, then um, the game needs a long time to, to find the chunk. And in this uh, situation, we say that the chunk is clustered. So uh, in this test world right here, I set up some command blocks to to load um, some cluster chunks. So the first thing we need, uh, we need a permanent loader because there's no point loading cluster chunks if they just get unloaded again. So let's just start with a with a permanent loader and then look at the, in the chunk debug tool. So um, currently we are right here, but if we go to the right over here, we have a permanent loader. Um, okay, and after we activate the permanent loader, uh, the next thing we can do is um, we can uh, load the cluster. And I will also load the unload chunk. I haven't explained that yet, but um, the unload chunk is basically just part of a cluster. Um, it's just the beginning of a cluster. And um, now that we've loaded this stuff, um, we can also go back here. And then uh, here, right, right here, we have a cluster. Uh, when you do it in survival with a larger view distance, it will probably not be as dense as, as this. Like this is only so dense because I use a really small hash size, and I use view distance too. But um, but this is basically a cluster, and we can now see the cluster um, by doing loaded chunk stump. So if I now do loaded chunk stump, then it will um, write um, a file into my server folder, and here we now see the, the chunk hash map. Um, it has currently a hash size of uh, 2000. Um, and somewhere in here, we see that there's like a, a large cluster of chunks with no gaps in between. Um, and this, these, these are where the cluster chunks. Like this, this large stretch of chunks which have not a single gap are cluster chunks. Um, and at the beginning of uh, the chunk, uh, where there's um, right here, this, uh, the first one right here is, is the, the unload chunk. Um, and if you want to uh, find, if you want to create cluster chunks in your world, then you can use um, a tool which Earth Computer has coded. Um, he has coded a foreign cluster finder, and I've uh, explained in a previous video how you can use it to um, to find the positions of cluster chunks and uh, how to load them. 
And um, basically what this tool does is um, if you have any chunk, which we call the class chunk, and the cluster finder will find um, first a chunk which has the exact same hash, which we call the unload chunk, and it will find um, a cluster of chunks um, which um, create like a long stretch uh, without gaps in the chunk hash map which starts uh, on the hash right after the unload chunk. And um, the reason we are interested in this is uh, that if you, the unload chunk is loaded and all the cluster chunks is lo are loaded, and you then load the glass chunk, then the glass chunk will first try to get into the index of the unload chunk because they have the same hash, but uh, it can't do that. After that, it will try to get in any spot in the cluster chunks, but since the cluster chunks don't have any gap, it won't do that either. And uh, that means that the glass chunk is then at the, the bottom and then the glass chunk is clustered. And then whenever the game tries to um, find the glass chunk, the, uh, the game first looks at the unload chunk and then has to look for all the cluster chunks uh, before it act can actually find the glass chunk. Another thing that's important to mention is that whenever you unload the unload chunk, the glass chunk will take the, the uh, index of the unload chunk and then it will no longer be clustered. So if you have unloaded the unload chunk, um, then the only way and you want the glass chunk to be clustered again, then what you need to do, you need to unload the glass chunk, you need to load the unload chunk, and then you need to load the glass chunk again, then it will be clustered again. And uh, this is a process which we call uh, reclustering. So you, for example, have to do this after every chunk swap, uh, swap attempt, like both after successful and unsuccessful chunk swap attempt. If you want the glass chunk to be clustered again, you have to do this uh, reclustering. Now, the question is, how does this knowledge help us improve uh, the chances of falling block swaps? The, the answer has to do with uh, falling sand code. So, um, the, um, whenever a sand um, tries to fall, it uh, first checks whether it's an entity processing chunks or not. So, it checks a 555 uh, area of chunks and checks whether they are loaded. And if they are all loaded, then it does normal falling behavior, while um, if one of the chunks is not loaded, then it does instant falling behavior. And uh, the important thing is just that it checks with 5 by 5 width of chunks. And the nice thing is that this checks happens precisely in the critical part of the falling block code during which uh, falling block swaps can occur. And um, this means if we can slow down these checks, then the sand will spend more time in precisely the part of the code in which we want it to spend time. And we are to slow down these checks, we can use cluster chunks because um, if the sand wants to check whether all these chunks are loaded, what it has to do, it has to go to the chunk hash map and, ask, and, and find each of these chunks in the chunk hash map. And um, if one of these chunks is clustered, for example, if a bottom white uh, chunk would be a glass chunk, and if it was clustered correctly, then uh, the game would need a long time to, to find this chunk. And then the game, uh, then the thread, which that's like the falling block code, would spend a lot of time precisely in the part of the falling block code which you want. Um, this means if you have a, a chunk which is highly clustered, uh, which is like within the 5 by 5 area, then it can improve uh, the chances of a falling block swap. Uh, but I should also mention that the, the, the cluster chunk which we use to improve the chance of a falling block swap would be more than eight blocks away from the sand block because there is also many checks for chunks um, which are outside of a part of code in which you want to um, do falling block swaps. Uh, so uh, when you have instant tactics on, whenever you activate a sand on observer, it will check whether it's eight blocks or more away from unloaded chunks. Um, because it only activates on instant tactics if it's uh, more than eight blocks away from unloaded chunks. Um, and this means that you shouldn't have any class chunks within eight, eight blocks because that would slow down the sand in the observers in a part of the code during which fallen block swaps cannot occur and then it would decrease the, the fallen block swap ch chances. So if you want to get uh, fallen block swaps, um, the best success rate, then you should make sure that there's a cluster chunk more than eight but less than 32 blocks away from the sand block and that's when ideal. So the chunk which I'm clustering with all these clustered chunks is uh, over here. Uh, I've marked it out with some obsidian. Uh, so this is the chunk which I'm clustering. And uh, if you want to perform falling block swap chances, then the worst uh, position where you could do it is inside the cluster chunk, because the clustering would drastically reduce the chances. The second worst spot where you could do it is within eight blocks of the cluster chunks. Uh, it would also reduce the chance, although not as much as if you do it inside. And um, then the third worst spot or second best spot is to just do it so far away that the clustering doesn't affect anything. But you can actually improve the chances if you are um, outside of this orange region here but still inside the green region. And then it will improve the chances because it will then only slow down the sand in the part of the code where um, falling blocks of chances can occur. So let's do um, another test um, to measure now the chances. We've now got, the, now got 1000 cluster chunks over there and we will run another test to see how many Falling and forty frame items we can get uh, now. So, like before, I will do two hundred fifty six attempts. So let's start this.
So uh, the test is finished and the async line is still alive. So this was about the test. Now let's break the async line and look at how many end portal frames we got. And now we got 62 end portal frames in 256 attempts. So instead of having 15 like before, we now got 62. So previous one 15 with plus doing 62. Uh, so in summary, um, if you want to do any kind of falling block swaps, um, then you should do your falling block swaps exactly two chunks away from the beacon tower because you will have a cluster for the beacon tower anyway, and then you can just use the same cluster to improve your falling block swap chances. And that's everything in this video. Um, bye. So let's quickly measure the usual falling block swap chances. Um, so I will use to get an estimate of the line. Yeah, that just happened. Okay, so this was an async packet crash. Um, this is like a concurrent modification exception in the player chat map. Uh, there is no way to prevent them, um, but you don't usually get one from async of the line. Okay, it's now doing automatic attempts. So we have the async. We got a pellet quad, very nice. Let's just uh, stop this attempt and restart this.